Yo, 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 yo! What's up, all you burner stoners and potheads out there? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you v- v- vipers doing out there, Mrs. Weedman? Mr. Weedman? How the hell are you? Great. How are you? I'm doing great. Ready to get baked with you, though. Yeah, we've got <laughs> something to celebrate tonight. It's Mr. <laughs> Weedman's big 5 Oh, the It's his 50. birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mr. Weedman. Thank you, Mrs. Weedman. I like yeah. to say thank you to you and O Dog, our daughter, for making me a delicious dinner tonight. Yeah, it's a bummer having a birthday on a Monday, though. Yeah, it's but kind of. Lame. You know what's great though? What? I get to record. Yeah. On my birthday, and I, yeah. I I wanted to, so I'm so excited. But I did have a great birthday weekend because I got to spend it with you, our son Polly, who was in town, O Dog, and Yuki at the beach on Friday. Yeah. That was special. We have not done that. Just the four of us and an extra five. I have to count Yuki, the dog. (laughs) Five of us, but especially four of us spending quality, amazing time together. It was just a great day. It was. We got to the beach early and we stayed till five, five, right? We were there. And we didn't move. Uh, I think Polly said he read 100 pages of his book. We played in the water. He swam with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. The water. Yuki we was in the water. Ball. Yeah, paddle ball. It was the just, dog up and down the beach. It was a very, very special day. It was great. And uh, it, we have tons of pictures, so I'll always remember it being a very special birthday weekend. And we came home that night, and some people came over, and we drank, and we smoked. And we smoked. Mrs. Weedman smoked a blunt that was rolled with Majin Fajita flour, mm-hmm. Majin Fajita keef, and her first hash blunt. Yeah. First time we smoked hash. It like, was fun to watch it. Yeah. So a friend of ours brought a friend of his over, and this guy was super, and he, he said he speaks Turpanese. He was great. I loved him. <laughs> so his name was Ben, and Ben brought, called his girlfriend and said, bring me some stuff. <laughs> so his girlfriend showed up with a dab rig and some dabs, and he... Took the you dabbed out of the Zenco too. You did, yeah, I did. Yeah, you did yeah. fresh. You did fresh I hash. I took really tiny, but you still did it. Hits. So you took your yeah. it was your first ex- experience. I was with pacing hash. myself because we right. were smoking all sorts. of oh, stuff. Oh, we smoked a lot, but yeah. it was fun. He took the the hash out and put it onto some parchment paper and rolled it like, and then it was too sticky. He said so. He added the hash, the I mean the keef to it to kind of make it less tacky, and he rolled it into like a little like. Like a noodle, yep. like a long skinny noodle, and laid it across the top of the joint before he rolled it yep. or the blunt, and uh, and we smoked. It was quite yummy. We smoked papers from our friend Crop King yeah. Blair, and we mm-hmm. smoked uh, Jungle Juice, and we still had half of it. He rolled a big one, so we saved a little bit for the show, and I just lit it up, so we're smoking it during the show. We're gonna get pretty just. Just had me going. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I instantly knew it was a sativa because Mr. Weedman was getting lit up, and it was like, okay, no more, no uh, more, Mr. Weedman. Yeah, but I had smoked. He okay. got to about a level eight, and we don't want him to get. To I was actually end. about a nine and a half. I think at one point <laughs> I was sweating. I was going fifty miles per hour. I was ready to run raps. But also, we had smoked a joint before. Mm-hmm. And just a, a straight up, we smoked a strawberry Kush breath before, which was a total indica yeah. dominant strain, and then we took hash and we put in the zenco and i probably ripped three hits Mm -hmm. nice hits and then we were all just talking and bullshit and drinking having a good time and then he then he goes you want me to roll a blunt with some hash in it and some key you got keef i'm like of course i got keef no don't do that don't do that (laughs) we we don't want that (laughs) and he rolled it so smooth oh very smooth and he rolled it, and we lit it up, and that thing, it was only like six of us out of the ten people out here that were smoking, because I think everybody else was either too drunk or too stoned as it was, and we, I enjoyed it, because I hadn't had one of those in a blunt in a while, rolled or something like that in a while. I've had them in joints, but not in a blunt, so in this blunt, this these Crop King papers roll so smooth, so, uh, and smoke so smooth, so we saved a little bit for the show, because I wanted to see how we would do on this during the show, especially Mrs. Weedman, and I wanted yeah, you guys- we'll see. Yeah, we'll see, so- <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's a 50 birthday celebration. I'm super psyched. I'm, I'm turning 50. A little no, reminiscent. You turned 50. You turned 50. That's it's right. It's no longer a thing in the future. You're 50, Mr. 50, Reed, man. I know. 50. Gosh, half a century old. Crazy. <laughs> so, but you made me a nice little birthday cake, too. Yeah. I thank you. A nice sure. little sweet little cake with some cupcakes around it. And everyone sung me happy birthday, and I appreciate it. it made me almost cry. <laughs> a little tear came down. So All right, I'm gonna stop smoking that because uh, I, I, I might not be able to see straight. 
I will uh, save it. Don't throw it, it out. I know I'm let it burn a little bit. Make a little incense burn. There you go. <laughs> what else? Oh, we're watching the oh, Netflix yeah. documentary about Woodstock '99. Now, I saw a documentary about the 94 one, a short one that was the Mud Pit. And then we watched a small little, like, like maybe like a two-hour show on the 99 episode and really saw some things. This one, though, goes deep. And we're on episode, we'll be on episode three tonight. It was three episodes. I, if you're a, a 90s, you know, lived through the 90s and, and heard about what happened, or maybe you went to Woodstock and you listened to our... Uh, our, our show, one of the three you went to, but watch that documentary and you really see how crazy, man. It was like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing about that. In '99, you had some of the hardest bands play at Woodstock: Rage Against the Machine, Metallica. You had uh, Kid Rock. You had Limp Biscuit. You had Corn and Corn, Limp Biscuit, and Kid Rock. At that time, in '98, '99, were like three of the largest newish hard rock bands but they were like they were in like their their like prime i mean they were they were oh, yeah. and those bands would just crush stages and crush pits and woodstock was supposed to be about peace and love and kindness and happiness and this wasn't about peace and love this no. was about fucking party and just get whacked. just get whacked and destruction i mean i think people went there thinking it was going to be like that but boy the bands you had play were nowhere near the style of bands that they had in 69 I mean, right. if you would have had that, it would have been a totally different type of festival. Uh, this was a rager festival. <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up in rage also at the end. So I won't want to ruin it for everybody, but I, I like it. So, uh, but yeah, so you ready to start the show? Let's do it. Let's do it. Diet weed. Do you believe there is such a thing called diet weed? Maybe it doesn't induce munchies? There is a cannabinoid. And I've talked about this a little bit, but this is a little deeper. Some more, some more um, research loaded with THCV. Okay. Okay, and it works as an appetite suppression. You do see some newer edible companies out there, or not newer edible companies, newer edibles from edible companies making edibles with THCV in it, and basically saying it's it it helps like. Not get the munchies, but also helps you lose weight. Oh, it's an give appetite me, I suppressant. Need some of that. Now that I'm 50, it's like, whoo. <laughs> so, how does cannabis suppress the appetite? The endo endo cannabinoid system, the ECS of the body, is a system which the cannabinoids in the plant matrix interact with. By direct or indirect stimulation of its receptors, it produces different physical and medical effects on the body. The mechanism for appetite increase, known as munchies, is modulated through the CB1 receptors. THC activates the CB1 receptors, which then stimulates the appetite. While there is still limited research on the mechanism, this remains the accepted explanation for this effect. Strains with large amounts of CBD along with THC can counter the mechanism of the CB1 receptors. This is because CBD acts at the CB2 receptor, which inhibits the action of the CB1 receptors. Okay? Strains with an increased ratio of CBD to THC have a high tendency to slow the urge to eat while high. THCV is another cannabinoid known to be effective in curbing increased appetite. Much like THC, THCV also interacts with the CB1 re receptors. However, its action is different. THCV acts as an antagonist on at both the cannabinoid receptors to, in the body. This simply means that it gives an opposite effect to that of THC in the body. As THC stimulates the pleasure of eating food... THCV acts to block these reward centers and make food less desirable. Mm. This is the reason why uh, cannabis users are experiencing weight loss more than those who do not use it. The question is now is why strains should one use to facilitate the appetite suppression. Understand something about edibles you're seeing in the market right now. Uh, I would say, and I'm not going to guarantee it, but I would say a lot of that THCV is not coming from the cannabis plant. Hmm. Synthetic? Synthetic. Um, I would say... Hey. But if you're a majority of it, if I'm what you're letting, taking in is, is organic, and then you've got the just, that little bit of synthetic... I'm just letting people know. Might it, be better than taking 
drugstore weight loss pills. Oh, right? absolutely. But there are some strains that will suppress your appetite that you can smoke. Uh, those that have a high CBD content, which acts through the CB2 receptors, will also have cannabis strains with high THCV content, which acts as an antagonist at the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Cannabis strains with high CBD content. Uh, Harl Tasso. Harl Tasso is a special hybrid strain that derived from two d- unique parents with high CBD percentage. Harlequin is a special CBD dominant strain that also has very little THC content. Sour Tsunami is the other pa- uh, patient and has a high CBD content like Harlequin. How you get Harley Tasso is gotten from a merger of both parents' names. Why do you have to make it so hard <laughs> to say? <laughs> I think you're really high. <laughs> the CBD characteristic of Harley Tussaud has made it very popular in medicinal marijuana for relaxation of patients with euphoria or paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> you're so high. I'm very high. <laughs> the high CBD content through its effects of the CB2 receptors will help to suppress appetite tremendously. Whew. Canna Tussaud. The strain is also sim- similar to Harlequin, as Sour Tsunami is one of the parent strains. The strain is known for its high CBD content and unique earthy and sweet flavor. Ramini. This is the most popular strain used to calm an overexcited appetite. It's hybrid gotten from a, a cross Afghani skunk and canatonic, which you, uh, I'm canatonic right now, which <laughs> caused its high CBD content and low THC content. Ramini has little or no psychoactive effects, while giving maximum relaxation and calm to its users. Uh, cannabis with the high THCV content, Durban Poison. Very, very good strain. If you high on overexcited appetite or you're looking to shed some weight without stopping your cannabis, look no further. The strain has an energetic high that can promote productivity with very uh, little or no euphoria. This is modestly due to the high THCV content, which gives the entourage effect coupled with THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids. Power Plant. This is a powerful strain. I've never even heard of this strain before. As the name suggests, which is from a long line of African landrace sativas, it could just be the answer to all your prayers towards resisting all junks that you use to quench the hunger pangs. The African strain is known for a spicy and peppery aroma. This helps in keeping the sense of their of their toes and not rumbling stomach. It also has a high THCV content like Durban Poison, which makes it and excellent for curbing appetite. I want to try that strain. If anybody knows where I can find that power plant, I want to try it. Moby Dick. This is a popular cannabis strain that is known for sweet, citrusy taste. The unique strain doesn't promote the onset of munchies like other strains. It gives an energetic and elevated feel without the unnecessary need to eat all you see. This is due to the high THCV in the strain, which makes Moby Dick perfect for suppressing appetite. Jack the Ripper. The special strain with a unique name has a high THC content of, of high THCV content as well. Its THCV content can rise as high as 5%. Wow. Which is complemented by its lemon scent to promote satisfaction. One characteristic known that Jack Ripper that it promotes an excited state which is expressed with a talkative mood. Ooh. <laughs> uh, so this is one more called Red Congolese. This is another strain with African heritage that possesses a high THCV content. It has a strong psychoactive effect, ooh, which is mostly targeted toward improve. I like this. I like the euphoria psychoactive effect that some of these strains give you, like that real, like where you feel like you're just floating, mm-hmm. like on on a cloud, and you just see a bunch of stuff moving around. I do like mm-hmm. that. Uh, which is mostly targeted at improving creativity and focus. Users of the dynamic strain are therefore more likely to indulge in physical activities like sports, hiking, and painting. Man, we need to get some of that when we when we go hiking on a trail or something like that. Mm-hmm. Something fun. Which this, they're less likely to be interested in exploring the contents of the fridge all the time. Sweet. So that's just about THCV and some strains to smoke that can, uh, you know, if, if you get the munchies and you don't want them anymore, find different stuff to smoke. Right. You know, right. so another good article by High Times. Yeah. I have one yeah. about uh, indicas and sativas for dummies. 
Why are you calling me a dummy? <laughs> <laughs> there are a few eternal debates intertwined with cannabis at the moment. One that stands out is the concept of indicas and sativas. Do these categories even make sense? When it comes to indicas and sativas, I think it's fair to say we could do a little better. And I offer no I not just the idea we can do better, but a solution. I think we should move on to referring to cannabis as Afghani or equatorial, as in the equator. It's a lot more accurate representation of what 99% of the marketplace consists of. If you're the Ruder, Ruder Alice, which is a... So I had to look this up. What is a Ruderalis? It is a low THC variety subspecies or species of cannabis, which is native to Central and Eastern Europe and Russia. So if you're the Ruderalis guy that needs to be offended by something, go back under your bridge. Nobody wants your pot. I remember when an empowered young bud tender got a lot of flack for a video where she highlighted how stupid the whole Indica Sativa debate was. A lot of people were really sad she made them feel like dum-dums. She got a lot of shit because of their sensitivities, but she was spot on. You can't even find her original post anymore, and I won't share it to save her any more drama and bullying. Not that she needs saving. I guess she was a pretty strong personality, right? Uh, I like what he wrote in, or she wrote in his article, though. Which I know is, I uh, edit. Be, <laughs> well, I, not everything reads well I know, without. I, I yeah. like it though. A spicy meatball. <laughs> she was a spicy meatball. <laughs> <laughs> but her struggle stirred something back up in me. I've dealt with the same frustrations she did. I was just a pinch more chipper about it. I've been working at the Canvas Buyers Club of Berkeley since 2009 and will still jump on the counter in the morning if an extra set of hands is needed due to a couple of call-outs or whatever it might be. I had turned off my frustrations early in my career on this subject. I would speak to the cannabis in four categories that were indica, sativa, and hybrids leaning in either direction. Eventually, I'd try and work a little education into the process because it all felt so bullshit. When you talk about things like the Hippie Trail, Super Sativa Seed Club, and other stuff that backbone the early heat seekers' genetics lines, a lot of it is going to fall into major equatorial or Afghani. Even today, what's the bulk of what we spoke? Just hybridizations of that stuff. All these indicas that we're puffing on, for the most part, are of Afghan origin. Are there some high mountain Kush Finos from the other side of the Pakistani border in the mix, too, for this discussion? Sure. But it's predominantly associated with Afghanis, so it keeps it a lot more simple to just use that as the umbrella term. As for everything else we smoke, you'll find a lot of genetics pool outside of Afghani are com that pool outside of Afghani are coming from places generally close to the equator. The southern Indian city of Kanyakumari. Pretty good. Yeah, Said thanks. that pretty good. <laughs> is about 560 miles north of the equator. The Thai beach town of Narathiwat is only 430 miles from the equator. Even Tapachula, Mexico, is only about 1,500 miles from the equator. But the system doesn't always work, like in India. India is not far from the equator at its southern tip, but the genetics it's known for are coming from thousands of miles away in its mountain region. It all seemingly makes sense, right? To help me articulate this great idea to the masses, I, needed, I knew I needed mascots, so I created Equatorial Ed and Afghan Annie to help move the masses away from saying indica or sativa. Umbrella terminology tends to never be perfect, but in this case, I was generally satisfied with how much could be categorized within the scope of these characters. We reached out to the pot prince of Bel Air to get his take, in 1997, Todd McCormick, a medical cannabis patient and childhood cancer survivor, was arrested with 4,000 plants. After serving his bid in the early 2000s, he returned to the scene and in recent years has focused on preserving old-school genetics like roadkill skunk. McCormick noted the question in itself is an excellent clarification that most people don't understand, but he prefers to use the term northern rather than Afghani. The reason I go with the word northern rather than Afghani is because the Hindu Kush mountains are freaking huge, and only part of the Himalayas are located in Afghanistan, McCormick said. I believe that a lot of us use Afghan as a default genetic for all northern cannabis, but I think we are sorely mistaken. 
McCormick also spoke to the India part of the debate I brought up. All the more northern variety, all of the more northern varieties of cannabis from India have the faster flowering broad leaflet, dense buds to protect the seeds from the cold, and these character characteristics are not only found in Afghanistan, McCormick said. In southern regions of India, cannabis indica have narrow leaflet, equatorial, tropical, long flowering characteristics of loose spindly flowers with a long flowering time. So obviously this debate is long from over, um, but it's interesting. I think that it would be neat to kind of start paying attention to that. We've talked about it a lot on, and over the few years we've been doing this show and over a lot of episodes about sativa and indica and hybrids. And we've also said the word sativa indicas and hybrids a lot in, right. uh, in right. all of because our shows. Because that's what most people know it's, and that's how packaging easy, is written. Right. It's easy to relatable. make it as a classification. But we've taught about all of it so many times and it's still hard to move away from that terminology to explain the kind of plant you're smoking. Because it is, cannabis sativa is just the plant. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tell you how much THC content or CBD content that plant is going to produce that you plant in the ground. It's just the plant. It's just mm-hmm. that is the, gen- the the genus of the plant. So, I mean, it's so hard because it's so drilled in our head. It's on pamphlets everywhere you go. Indica puts you to sleep or makes you relax on the couch, in the couch as we <laughs> call it. Sativa makes you run around and do laps. Hybrids are a mix of the two because some people like to feel kind of both. Rudiella's plants are the plants that you see now that are all being helped to be made into auto flowers. It, it's just because the fast uh, response time of growing because they grow they grew in in Siberia and they only had two months. Boom, done, mm-hmm. gotta go. So that's why you see auto flowers are sixty days. Uh-huh. So. There's so much to be taught, but it, it for the for I think for consumers like people going to dispensaries that that aren't well versed and well knowledge and just want to smoke something, it was easy to explain it that way. Didn't have yeah. to go into, you know, if someone say hey, I'm going to a concert tonight, I just need to join. It's going to get me going. Oh, here's a sativa for you. Here's Durban. Here's here's Jack Herrera. Man, it's going to get you going at the show. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, hey man, I'm having trouble sleeping. I'm out of town. You know, sleeping at a hotel, I sleep like shit at hotels. What do you got for sleep? Oh, here's an indica strain, Northern Lights. This will put you to sleep. Right. So it's just, it was just easy. Oh, here's a hybrid. This will get you both. So it's just, I don't know. One day, I think, as weed becomes more and more and more in the public mind, there's new stuff to read about. People are really really want to read more about it. They'll learn more. You know, listen to podcasts, whatever. You know, how do I know? You know, I still call it sativa indica and hybrid myself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how big will legal weed get? I don't know. Let's find out. Even volatile economic times, weed industry analysis and pundits are bullish about the future of legal weed. Predictions of an American legal weed industry with total retail sales as high as a hundred billion dollars by the end of the decade abound. How realistic are such numbers? Projections about weed market revenue are uniquely difficult. There are lots of moving parts in play, with state regulations and taxes changing rapidly, and the looming prospect of federal legalization coming in as yet unknown form. But we think anyone who projects a $100 billion weed market by 2030 is looking through a rose-colored glasses. Hmm. Illegal weed beats legal on price. We all know that. Yeah, everyone still has got a plug. If you didn't have enough money to go to a dispensary that much, you call your plug up, you'd probably get a twenty, thirty dollars cheaper. So it is cheaper. You don't pay taxes on it. You don't fucking have to pay all the cost of cost to grow it and 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 payroll and labor cost and this and that and that. So we all know. I mean the legal the the uh, traditional market still does I think just as much, if not more, than the legal market. So legal weed does not tend to have fancier packaging, label, and safety certifications too. But the illegal weed does not have, and some consumers are willing to pay extra for these things. But nobody can tell from smoking, vaping, or eating the product whether it's legal or illegal. For most price-sensitive consumers, the advantages of legal weed just aren't worth the extra money. Hmm. Uh, Falling legal prices can limit revenue. As legal weed gets cheaper and more competitive... 
revenue is unlikely to grow by much, even as the quantity increases. So as we see prices fall, don't forget, though, sometimes what you what happens when you see falling prices, Mrs. Weedman, you know, quality goes quality. down, right? Because mm-hmm. they're just giving you shit. Right. So remember that. Revenue equals price times a quantity. So if quantity rises because prices fall, then the total size of the legal weed market as measured by total revenue could increase modestly, stay the same or even decrease. Plus, traditional market weed isn't going anywhere. Even if legal weed businesses can't readily adopt all the same innovative technologies and practices as legal ones, they can and will take advantage of some improvements, such as more lighting, more productive strains, and better yields. Because you, you pay somebody a, bill, a breeder to give, make you a strain, money talks. So... Um, why an overhauled cannabis market matters. We should all care when analysis overvalue an industry. Very, just trust me, look at the stock market of cannabis stocks. They overanalyze big time. <laughs> <laughs> bad information leads to bad investments, and a lot of people lose their money. Ooh. Investment hype diverts money from productive investments in less glamorous parts of the economy. Ooh, good profitable companies and other industries who compete for the same funders have a harder time finding the money they need to grow. (laughs) Very interesting article. We've been talking about it, a little bit about how the cannabis industry is doing and how the the legal market is doing. And in a lot of states, especially your West Coast states, prices have fallen. Michigan, prices have fallen. Uh I mean, you can get an. I I, I t- said in the last episode there was a guy in Oklahoma selling twenty dollar ounces, hmm. two for forty. <laughs> <laughs> two for forty. I wonder how if it was real crap. You're still paying. Like, is it because it's no? Oh, like, it, who knows? But so much. Somebody's overstock. gonna buy. T- someone's gonna buy an ounce for twenty bucks. I don't care. I don't care if it's lower than the lowest on the on the plant. Buds, someone will still buy it for 20 bucks and and someone will still get high Mm -hmm. and probably not care that it had the greatest flavor or it smoked smooth or had all these great terpene. Man, those people just want to fucking just get a fucking good buzz on Mm -hmm. for 20 bucks. Get an ounce. Why not? Right. You know how long an ounce would last somebody like me and you? Yeah. For 20 bucks. Last us a couple weeks, maybe two, three weeks. That's it. An ounce. Maybe, maybe two weeks. I don't know. We smoke a lot of weed now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so uh i don't know just the market's going all over the place right now just learn to grow your own that's all i gotta tell you grow your own fucking weed learn to grow your own medicine so you don't have to buy it from anybody and you know what you're putting into it you don't have to go to a dispensary you don't have to go to your plug find a collaborative find one person that'll grow 10 plants and you each get a plant and that plant will last you and then just recycle invest in it if you don't want to take the responsibility to grow find somebody and pay them to help grow buy their next round of seeds for them for 100 bucks and get 10 good feminized seeds and say grow these plants for me and then you get to keep some of the yield for yourself and I get to keep the rest there you go you're not doing anything illegal. Right. There's nothing illegal about that. Right. You're buying some stuff to help it grow. Just like I'm helping a buddy of mine grow some tomatoes. Tomatoes? You know? Tomatoes. You know no, what a tomato tomatoes. is? I don't know. What is a tomato? Half mater, half potato. You know what a potato is? <laughs> half potato, half mater. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, uh, this is you. This is a good one, too. This is another good article. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Brands and retailers should look to cannabis to stand out in brick and mortar. While the digital transformation of the past 10 years, accelerated by the pandemic conditions of the past two, have been beneficial in many ways for brands and consumers alike, it has also created new sets of disparities, winners and losers. For brands struggling to bounce back their brick and mortar operations in this recalibrated marketplace, they may be best served taking a cue from an unlikely place, the cannabis industry. The drive to capitalize on the booming online marketplace of the last couple of years helped bolster sales for consumer packaged goods brands with an established digital footprint. But as a battle for customers consolidated and intensified, the investment needed to compete became unsustainable for many small and medium-sized businesses. Prices soared, and return on ad spend plummeted. One study showed 
that for every 92 marketing dollars spent, only that only converted to one dollar in sales. When you and I were talking about that earlier, and I when I read that article about ninety two dollars, almost a hundred bucks to make a buck. Yeah. Oh my god. Crazy. For tech giants capable of eating massive losses, these numbers enabled further commodification of web sales. For smaller brands, they had to seek alternatives. Influencer marketing seemed like a logical emerging solution, an organic way of reaching customers using channels they trust. When you factor in that some studies show nearly 50% of consumers rely on influencers to make informed shopping decisions, this approach may help smaller brands make up ground. Oh, Mr. Weedman's burning my computer. Yeah, you gotta, Hang on a second. You gotta have that. You gotta have that I last have hit. One more it's hit. the last oh, it's hit. So tiny. I know it's the last burn hit. My fingers. I know. Hit it. I want you. To just, that's oh. it. Good. That's it. Because it's down to the end. I'm Sorry, gonna, everyone. I burn my lip. That's it. No. Oh, that was the last I melted my that upper was the lip. Last hit, that's though. great. Awesome. I had to have you at the last one. Thank you, I Mr. Wanna... Weedman. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Tasted good, but my lip burned. All right. Where were we? For smaller brands, they had to seek alternatives. All right, so then we were talking about influencers. Now I got a piece of hair in my mouth. (laughs) Okay, so they went to influencers, right? When you factor in that some studies show nearly 50%, this is crazy, 50% of consumers rely on influencers to make informed shopping decisions. That's a crazy one, too. When I read that, I was like, holy fuck. This approach seemed to maybe help smaller brands make up ground. Yet with some influencers' fees topping $10,000 and tough-to-measure return on investment or on sponsorships and endorsements, this avenue is fraught with risk. It's risky. Ten grand? Come on. And as customers grow increasingly dubious in, of inauthentic posts from their countless lifestyle vloggers in their feeds, perhaps catalyzed by... By recent guidance from the FTC, who is now mandating widespread hashtag ad disclosures. So now if it's influencer, if you're being paid to talk about a product, look at the hashtags. So if you want to know if it's if it's an authentic, um, just an influencer saying, I love this product, uh, check the hashtags. If it says hashtag ad, they're being paid to tell you that. Um, so maybe don't put so much weight into their opinion. Hashtag what? Ad. 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 Okay. It's ad and advertising. Right, right. So look at their hashtags and it says hashtag ad. ad. Got it. I never, F- I never noticed that before. And the FTC mandated that. Wow. Um, okay. So businesses are feeling paralyzed in where to place their marketing dollars. Eight Decades has that struggle right now. Where do we want to put our dollars? 100%. How are we going to market? Do we do social media? Do we hit the pavement? Do we find the retail? It's tough to be a small business. Yep. Um in a world of social media presence, in a world right? of major corporations and that major, own everything, yeah, uh, the rapid growth of influencer marketing as a marketing channel gets at the heart of a valuable truth: when a consumer trusts an informed recommendation, they convert. Luckily, small and medium-sized brands and retailers across industries already have a built-in resource: their frontline employees. As businesses look for a resurgence in their brick-and-mortar operations. They need to recognize how many influencers are already on their payroll. Taking a cue from pioneers in this field, cannabis sellers can be a great place to start. The cannabis industry is a study in resourcefulness and adaptability. When Colorado first emerged as the first legitimate market for adult-use cannabis, the industry was and continues to be governed by a complex patchwork of state and federal legislation preventing traditional forms of advertising or consumer outreach. Yes, and we just talked about that now not only can you not do anything cannabis-related on certain platforms of social media. I got booted off TikTok. On Google. Uh, you know, all of they they just don't want cannabis-related anything out there. TikTok especially. It's crazy. Facebook, day, and, Facebook and, and Instagram. You can't pay for an ad, but you can... You can post, right? This day and age. It's crazy. Um, I just totally forgot what I was talking about. You were talking about Zuckerberg being a jerk. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, (laughs) advertising. Yes, traditional forms of advertising. (laughs) As a result, canvas brands, retailers, and their employees had to become their own form of influencer. 
bud tenders became experts within their field and became educators as well as salespeople, a combination of uninformed consumers, a vast selection of products, and a wide open competitive landscape meant the role of the bud tender as a trusted advisor quickly became imperative. Without the luxury of digital commerce afforded to traditional brands and retailers, cannabis businesses ostensibly needed to build from nothing. As retailers and traditional consumer packaged goods verticals now struggle to build back their brick-and-mortar sales, despite some encouraging signs in the post-pandemic world, they'll need to leverage every tool at their disposal, and it begins with their employees. Despite the digital transformation's profound effect on how and where we shop, the fact remains that in-store shopping accounts for more than 85% of retail sales. Furthermore, 46% of consumers note that they prefer to shop in-store rather than online. For the cannabis industry, it was never much of an option. Brick-and-mortar sales were and are the cornerstone of their businesses. To stand out in a crowded field, they had to focus on service. Brands and retails need to empower and incentivize employees to be their experts, advocates, and ultimately, influencers. But this can't merely be an extra responsibility pushed on already overworked employees. Building an incentive-based compensation structure is the single best way to guarantee employees are focused on the metric that mattered most, sales and customer satisfaction. The cannabis industry also worked hard to encourage the employee influencer model by highlighting bud tenders and promoting their expertise. As retailers look to bolster their brick and mortar sales in an increasingly digital world, it's essential to remember that customer experience begins with employee experience. By incentivizing employees and encouraging them to become experts and influencers, as the cannabis industry has done since its inception, everyone wins. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's a better approach. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a tough world when social media rules and people have influencers, a uh, two hundred million people following them, and they mm-hmm. can pull out one product and maybe a and sell a million of it in an hour. Yeah. You know, and then you have some of the small business owners that we know, and we are a small business owner, and have no employees. You can't throw that kind of money around. Yeah, we to don't. Get, right. To get that I can't pay ten thousand dollars to an influencer. I don't have that kind of money. I spend all yeah. my money on buying products to to <laughs> hopefully sell. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we have to do some guerrilla marketing. Right. So Does that'll be us. Anybody know what that is? I love guerrilla marketing. <laughs> Shit, it's I remember uh, growing up. It the, works. I grew up in the Bronx, and I never forget the first time I saw what guerrilla marketing was, and found out years later that's what it was called. Right. But but seeing it at twelve years old in the subways, watching young hip hop artists sell their their tapes mm-hmm. to people, you know, yeah. on the subway. First, they would give it to you. Some people would mm-hmm. give it to them for free. There'd be one song on there, just listen and listen to it. And then the next time you saw them, they were selling a full demo for five bucks hmm. out of that's their cool. out of their backpacks. And you saw 15 to 20 year old kids out there just preaching their hip hop in the subways. It was that's dope. Cool. I mean, I loved it, you know, watching that. That's when them and I learned that's what it was called, guerrilla marketing. I was like, holy hmm. shit. Give something away free for the first time, give them a little taste. They come back the next time, they'll buy it if they like it. Sure. Guerrilla marketing at its finest. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it is. Here's something. All right. I posted this on my Instagram and, uh, I just, uh, there's a lot of shit going on right now in the world when it comes to cannabis and cannabis laws and a lot of countries, you know, out there that that are still just the United States is still not federally legal to them. But here's something that got me first. Biden's daughter-in-law reportedly shopped at cannabis dispensary, but wait, you ready for this? With Secret Service protection, I I, I, I was fucking (laughs) flabbergasted. Fucking when I I had to post this, and I don't normally post political shit on my on my social media. It has to hit me hard for me to post something like this, and this was like a smack to every prisoner behind bars for a nonviolent cannabis crime. Your fucking daughter in law, and I don't even want to talk about his son because like I don't give a fuck about him. Fucking crack addict. His daughter in law reportedly shopped at a cannabis dispensary with the Secret Service. Why aren't you arresting her? 
Hypocrisy. Well, what did she do that was illegal? I'm I'm stoned. It's she, <laughs> if she went into illegal, it's fine. Right. Okay. But here's the frustration. She went in with Secret Service agents. Right. That are paid by the federal right. government. She's using them to go buy. But doesn't she have to get followed? She has to be protected, doesn't she? She's... Sure. But. There was more to that story, wasn't there? No. No, there's not more to that story. It is not. She went into a California dispensary. dispensary and brought her guys. Brought the seat. But the Secret Service went into a dispensary that federally bound right, right, to not right, even right, be right. around one. Right. But it's okay with her. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm getting at. That's what you're getting at. Just preferential treatment, I believe that's called. Thank you, Mrs. Weedman. Glad you're on my team. I'm on it. <laughs> Sorry, I was just really high, so I was all right. struggling. That's why to I follow. saved that last hit for you. Thanks. I struggled not to smoke it. Yeah. And I gave it to you. Thanks. You're welcome. June cannabis sales in 11 markets decreased slightly from May to 1.65 billion. Eastern markets, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, and Pennsylvania in June, year-over-year growth range from minus 9% in Maryland to 23.5% in Florida and Michigan. Note that Florida, Maryland, and Pennsylvania are medical only. So Florida in June sales increased 3.2% to $192.4 million. <laughs> They're only a fucking medical state. <laughs> Crazy. <isn't it? laughs> Illinois, uh, previous published data release states showed a decline 3% from May and increased 5.4% in June. Um, so, but July, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, now a good month for Illinois. Maryland sales fell 3% from May to $41 million, down 9% from a year ago. Ooh, flower sales decreased 10%, pre-rolls declined 9%, and concentrates fell 13%, while ingestibles grew 6% year over year. Hmm. Hmm. Massachusetts sales grew 0.9% and 9.4% compared to a year ago to $145 million. Man. Michigan, we had uh, talked about on a prior episode, uh, Point five percent, uh, one hundred eighty-seven point four million. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, Pennsylvania sales fell one point six percent in June and ninety-four point eight million down seven point six. It's only medical there, and prices I heard are a little little high. Taxes are a little high there. You know, it's only medical, and then they can go now to New York or other a couple other states that they can go and get still get uh dispensary legal weed and it's cheaper because it's recreational prices. I mean it's not cheaper. Well yeah, I guess it depends. Um uh, cheaper probably not to have to worry about getting a license and any of that stuff. Right. Yeah. You know? Uh Western markets, Arizona combined uh, sales of hundred six million were down two point seven percent. I heard it's like fucking crazy down there right now. The 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 market down there. Hmm. Like nuts. California sales declined two point five percent to four hundred and thirty one million. <laughs> Colorado sales increased 0.6% in June compared to May. Hmm. Hmm. They've been dropping a lot. Nevada sales increased 1.7%. Falling, though, 18.9% from a year ago to $66.4 million. Ooh. Oregon sales f- in June fell 2.3%. Hmm. So there's some of the some of the markets. But then you got Illinois, though, in, in July, hit second highest total, $135 million. Hmm. 135 million in July. It was the next highest since December of 2021. Crazy, second highest ever since since recreational. Hmm. That's big. That's not. That's, that's just yeah. straight wreck. That's not mad. People were smoking this year because you know lockdowns are coming back again. Mask mandates are happening in California again. Partying too hard this summer. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something crazy. Arkansas should have cannabis going on the ballot. Uh, for recreational, and the governor tells police to stand firm against cannabis legalization ballot initiative that's heading to court. Governor, man, you're screwing up, kid. You're screwing up. Canopy reports, now listen to this, this is not a million, this is billion. A two, canop, Canopy reports $2.1 billion loss on massive cannabis unit impairments. Wow. $2.1 billion. That's a lot of money. That's Canadian dollars, but that's one point six billion, one point seven billion American dollars, though. Still, that's a lot of money. Ooh. All right. So, this is 
Advocates demand Biden take cannabis action after Brittany Greener sentenced to nine years in Russian prison for vape. For vapes. Okay. I read the whole article about Brittany Greiner. I feel absolutely horrible for her. I also feel absolutely horrible for the teacher that just got arrested. I also read an article. It was a girl years ago, a 19-year-old girl got arrested for cannabis in Russia, and she only got two months and some fines. I get all that. Here's the thing, okay? We are fighting for two people, or actually truly one person, to get out of Russia. Yes, is it ridiculous? It's nine years. Yes, it shouldn't even be illegal there. I've already said all this. Every country has laws on cannabis. Whether we don't like them, whether we hate them, whether we think they're stupid, whether we think, look in the Philippines, if you get caught weed, you get shot and killed. <laughs> Yep. So do we, and I'm sure there's people have gotten shot and killed in the Philippines for weed. Okay. Do I see, do we see anybody uproaring about that? Like we're seeing. Well, that was martial law. That was their, their government. Right. Said if, if you know someone is a drug dealer and you see them dealing drugs, you can just murder them. Right. That was nuts. Right. So Russia has, whether we like Russia or not, whether you like or agree with their human beings over there too. Okay, they have their laws. Their laws are cannabis laws. It's illegal. Maybe they're a little bit stricter here in 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 Russia than they are here in the United States. But they're still it's still federally illegal in the United States. You still can go to jail in the United States for cannabis. There's forty thousand people in prison right now for cannabis in the United States. You cannot. Go to Russia, who hates us right now, more... They hate us. They hate the United States for us aiding another country. Why would they say, yes, here's your here's your American who brought vapes to our country, and our laws say no cannabis, and we... Here's, here's back. You really think they're, they give a fuck? No! Now, this is even more of a stunt, because they threw a couple of Americans in jail going, hey, fuck you. Nine years and 14 years for the teacher. Don't forget that. 14 years for a teacher. Okay? And we're worried about two people. I don't care if she's a fucking basketball player. If she's... It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter that teachers... It, it, it doesn't matter. Okay? 40,000 prisoners here in the United States. We have our laws still. They have their laws. You, I am not mad. I'm upset for Brittany, and I'm upset for that teacher that they're stuck in jail for cannabis laws. But I'm not. It's, what I'm really pissed off about is the hypocrisy of all of this bullshit that we keep on falling for as humanity. That's why I'm pissed off, and that's why I saved that strain for that smoke for tonight because I knew it was going to get me fired up. Right or wrong, I don't care what you believe in this stories that we're reading. It's one person. 40,000 people in the United States, don't forget that, are federally locked up. That gentleman in Louisiana who we've talked about for 1.5 ounces doing life in the United States of America. Life for 1.5 ounces. I don't care if you said you forgot to put the vapes were in your bag or not. If you knew you were going to Russia and you knew that they hated us right now, you would do nothing to fuck up. Whether you said you forgot they were in there or not, it's hard for me to believe because I've traveled across country and didn't sneak a vape in. I bought vapes in and I bought edibles in and I used them and I got them in. You were trying to bring a vape in because that's what you do. Admit to it. Okay? You forgot they were in there. Come on. That's like what I used to my parents when I was 12 years old going, oh, I forgot that was in there. <laughs> you don't leave vapes sitting in your suitcase. I'm not trying to and be. Maybe she, maybe she did. I'm but not trying to be a jerk. Right or wrong. It's that you just don't make those mistakes when you're dealing with a country like Russia in the times that we're in. Right. right. Now. It was just a really dumb mistake. However, it happened. And in the big picture of things, like Mr. Weedman saying, in the big picture of things, she's one person that's getting a shit ton of media attention. When right here in our own country, where half of this country, it's it's legal 
to have cannabis, there's still thousands, tens of thousands of people sitting in jail for forty thousand for nonviolent cannabis crimes. So carrying a joint and you get caught. Having, you know, your stash in your car and you get caught. Stupid shit like that. People are serving life, 10 years, 20 years. All these ridiculous sentences it, that just are not justifiable. Whether it's legal or not, it's just, it's stupid. You get rapists that get a minute. You get they child of sex offenders that get, a, you know, a home arrest with a, a bracelet on their, their ankle. And someone has a bag of fucking weed and they spend years in jail. Wow. So it's just mind blowing that we're going to focus and the president's writing letters and plea bargaining. I mean, it sucks. And trade offs. Don't get us wrong. It completely sucks. Right. She's in a foreign country. They're not going to treat her well. It's not going to be good for her and for the teacher. That's that's there also. They're not going to have a good experience. Not that jail here would be a good experience, but at least she could maybe see family and friends and people could come visit her when there's visit times. It's just going to be a different world and it's awful. And maybe we, it's not awful though, there. We don't know. We don't know. I would maybe it'd just be like maybe. a regular prison like it is in the United States because of human uh, human right laws now. Right. I mean, it's all over the world. People are watching. Yeah. I don't think she's got. It's going to be the best prison, but she's also a celebrity that goes to Russia to play basketball too. Don't forget that she was there to play basketball in the ba- the Russian basketball league. She was invited there to play. So this could be also a publicity stunt on Russia too, saying, "Hey, we got one of your players who came in and did this." But I'm sure she's well respected. It's not the first time she was going there to play either. Hmm. So. She was getting paid to go play basketball in Russia. So I hmm. don't think they're going to beat her up. Right. <laughs> well, we don't know. Right. Big picture, though, is shit needs to change. 100%. And, uh, yeah. If you don't know about the Last Prisoner Project, you should search them on the Internet and look them up and follow them on social media. They're doing phenomenal things to try to expunge people's records, help them uh, get back into the workforce when they get let out of prison, fighting for the people who are in prison for nonviolent cannabis crimes. They're just, they're out there and they're just pounding the pavement every day, doing the right work to try to get these people out. And they're, they're worth your time. Right. And to me, here's, here's the thing. You have Kamala Harris too, speaking about this and she got called out, uh, by, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, just calling people out for the pot. She, I mean, Kamala Harris literally put fifteen hundred people in jail for cannabis crimes in in California, mm-hmm. in San Francisco, fifteen hundred. Joe Biden wrote laws on drugs. He was part of the whole war on drugs. It's, a lot of this is all his fucking fault hmm. that half of these fucking laws are here in this country. So don't fool yourselves out there. Don't fall for it. It's fucking voting time. It's fucking going into voting fucking November, man. The, the fucking primaries just came up. They're going to do whatever they can to make sure everyone looks good right now. Right. Oh, we're fighting for cannabis people. Yeah, where? Show me. Not in this fucking country. You're out your mind. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, <laughs> how do you talk cannabis with your doctor? Because I got a doctor's moving appointment on. soon. <laughs> yes. And this is an article written by a doctor. Um, now that you're incorporating cannabis into your lifestyle, whether to enhance wellness or alleviate chronic symptoms, it is time to talk, to talk with your doctor. You may wonder why disclosure is important. Truthfully, it has a lot less to do with science and a lot to do with a patient-physician relationship. Let me explain. To date, most general physicians are in the dark about cannabis. We do not know which prescription drugs interact with cannabis. We know very little about its long-term effects or if the relief patients experience with cannabis is in part a placebo effect. Very few studies have been published to date. This is because cannabis, as a study drug, is unprofitable. Clinical trials cost tens to hundreds of millions. Therefore, the motivation to effectively study cannabis as a drug is limited. That means physicians are left with personal experience or anecdotal evidence shared by brave patients. For the inquisitive doctor, there are published case studies offering data for the relationship between cannabis and decreased 
use of opiates or how cannabis lessens seizures in people with a type of seizure disorder. These studies, burgeoning and informative, offer clinicians very little practical guidance. Ironically, you as a consumer know more about cannabis than your doctor. For one, many doctors are reluctant to experiment with cannabis because of the strict hospital and federal workplace drug policies. Second, physicians simply don't have the bandwidth to learn an entirely new medication class, especially one as vast and variable as cannabis. A A cannabis consumer, on the other hand, can walk into a dispensary or trade show and educate themselves on the cannabis microcosm through books, subscriptions, uh, magazines, online media, social media, and with the good old trial and error. A savvy consumer is practically a professional one. So where does this leave us? From my perspective, the cornerstone of a healthy patient-physician relationship is trust, shared decision-making, and an open communication. In an ideal world, you would tell me that you vape cannabis for insomnia, and I'd share with you that I have no clue how it will affect your sleep pattern or long-term health. I would also thank you for sharing and tell you to continue listening to your body and do what feels right. I may refer you to a cannabis physician or continue to manage your care by learning from you and others like you. Ultimately, sharing cannabis with your doctor is a personal decision. My hope is that together, doctors and patients will continue to experiment, learn, and grow together. These are interesting times, and what better time to strengthen your relationship with your healthcare provider? Sweet. I'm yeah, going. I have told some physicians if it comes up and others not, um, and you get very mixed responses. And then there's always that like hovering concern of insurance and uh, federal laws that govern, you know, the the greater body of health insurance. And if you have on record that you use cannabis, is it going to be a like kind of like a um, a negative? Like, could they drop you as as an insured patient because you use cannabis and it's now on record? So I I don't know. I'm, it were I've I've actually asked doctors like I'll talk to you about this. I'm going to tell you that I use cannabis, but I'm going to ask you not to put it into my file. And you still, you know, like now everything is digitized and you can see your doctor's notes. They still put it in there. Right. Um, you know, the, it depends on the doctor, I guess. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah. it's interesting. I hope more doctors prescribe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of them just don't understand it. Don't understand just it. Just like Especially people the, in general, the old, the right? old, Yeah, some of the older doctors probably don't. Yeah. So uh, Switzerland... Oh, international news. Switzerland, uh, basically, we know they went med. People are asking about REC. So they're running a, a pilot program, which is pretty cool. Small, but they're starting off trying to check it out. But also for trial, cannabis must be organic, which I think is great. Produced in Switzerland and contain no more than 20% THC. Uh, like I said, it's a, it, they're trying it out, man. They got to do it sometime. So a uh, billion dollars and create about 44 it can, the income could be about $1 billion and can create around 4,400 full-time jobs. That's pretty dope. Good for them. Crazy. Can- Canadian growers destroyed a record 425 million grams of cannabis last year. Jeez. 425 million grams. <laughs> that is fucking ins. One, not only just the waste of weed, but how much water it took to fucking grow all that bud. I mean, and and if they use soil or if they used whatever they used, nutrients, but the water on top of growing, just fucking wasteful. The cannabis industry is fucking, the corporate cannabis industry is fucking wasteful. Well, a lot of industries are. But it just, this was supposed to be like. Organic. Well, not just even organic, but just like. About the keeping the earth safe, and it's not anymore. It's just brutal, man. 425 million grams of cannabis. Give it away. Mm-hmm. Don't fucking waste it. Let people smoke it, man. You're losing the money anyway. Right, right. Are you fucking kidding me? Give it away. Governments of the fucking world, man. You're fucking just... For, you wasted people's valuable resources. To grow a plant that we could use as a medicine and you wasted 425 fucking million grams. 
Get the fuck out of here. Well, it's well, my just... birthday, so I'm acting like an asshole right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm 50, and I'm gonna act. I'm. This is the show. I'm gonna be like this, and then we'll go back to normal maybe on the next one. But fuck you, fuck you, man. That is fucking bullshit. I, I just I'm fucking disgusted. Let's go to something peaceful. I need to get back in my own. <laughs> Come back. The tale Come behind back. the meaning of Puff the Magic Dragon. Live there by you go. the sea. All right, this is like 69 Woodstock. A minute yes. ago, you were like 99 Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was about like 94. I was mm, the mud pit. <laughs> you, were getting, you were getting into a little limp biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to break some shit. <laughs> I'm about to break. <laughs> all right. Hey, yeah. I did it all for the nookie. That's right. So I can get that cookie and stick it up here. Okay. Here he goes. See? Oh, he's right. definitely he's right. definitely Woodstock 99. All right. The tale right. behind the meaning. All right, Puffy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the tale behind the meaning of Puff the Magic Dragon by Peter, Paul, and Mary. In 1962, one of the most endearing children's folk songs was written. Initially penned as a poem, the story of Puff the Magic Dragon was of a friendly flying serpent who lived by the sea in a land far away, Hanali, and enjoyed frolicking in the autumn mist. Recorded and released by folk trio Peter, Paul, and Mary, Puff the Magic Dragon became an instant hit, relishing in childhood innocence and imagination and a special imaginary friend. In 1959, 19-year-old Leonard Lipton, then studying at Cornell University in New York, wrote a poem inspired by a 1936 poem by an American poet, Ogden Nash, The Tale of Custard the Dragon. Though poetry wasn't his forte, the physics major was convinced he could write a better dragon poem than Nash's and began typing his new story up on his roommate Peter Yarrow's typewriter. Yarrow found the poem and wrote Puff the Magic Dragon, based on Lipton's poem. By the time Yarrow formed Peter, Paul, and Mary with Paul Stuckey and Mary Travers, he already had the song Puff the Magic Dragon. Pulled from Lipton's original poem, Yarrow renamed the dragon Puff and gave his former roommate writing credit when the song was later released by the group in 1963. Uh, already gaining some attention with their 1962 self-titled debut and hitting the charts with songs Lemon Tree and If I Had a Hammer, Peter, Paul, and Mary always included Puff in their live set since forming in 1961 and before releasing it. Upon its release, the song instantly reached the easy listening and R&B charts and peaked at number two on the Hot 100 chart. Puff's popularity is a phenomenon that I don't comprehend because Puff has not been promoted like Mickey Mouse, said Lipton in 2009, 50 years after you wrote the song. Puff the Magic Dragon got to where he is because people like him, not because of any marketing effort, because there had been little of that. In 1978, Puff the Magic Dragon became a movie, the story of a little boy who couldn't speak for a long time until a magic dragon helped him find his voice. In 2007, Scholastic released the first Puff the Magic Dragon children's book using the lyrics of Yarrow and Lipton's penned song as their story. I think Puff the Magic Dragon is about a little boy and a dragon, said Lipton of the meaning of the song. I think there are strong parallels between the story told in the song and Peter Pan. You've got Jackie Paper, you've got Wendy, you've got Hana Lee, you've got Neverland, and you've got Pirates. Puff sadly dis declines in his cave, which reminds me of Tinkerbell needing to be revived. There are parallel elements, and the theme is similar. Peter Pan is a boy who wouldn't grow up, and believe me, I don't blame him. Jackie Paper, though, Don't does... grow up. It's a trap. <laughs> Jackie Paper, though, does grow up, and so leaves Puff. Through the marijuana-induced haze of the 1960s, an urban legend arose soon after the release of the song, speculating that the true meaning of Puff the Magic Dragon was a euphemism for smoking weed with a character Jackie Paper, linked to rolling papers. Lipton vehemently denied that the song was about drugs, because Puff was more innocent than that. It centered around childhood innocence and not getting high. When he wrote Puff at Cornell, Lipton says students were more interested in going to hootenannies than smoking joints. 
In a 2015 interview, Lipton added, a song for little kids that advocates the use of drugs would not be appropriate. Advocating marijuana for little kids is not a good thing. Lipton went on to produce 25 films and create a number of patents under his name, including his invention of the stereoscopic technique of filming movies in real 3D, which was used in the 1980s. The artist also won various awards, including one from the Smithsonian Institute for his invention of Crystal Eyes, the first shuttering eyewear for stereoscopic displays in 1996. To this day, Lipton still receives royalties from his favorite dragon. Puff was my financier, shared Lipton. He funded my work in electronic stereoscopic displays. Puff, unlike my other investors, never asked for anything back. He never grilled me at the board meeting. He never lectured me about having to make a profit. He never told me I had to cut out projects I loved. He was never greedy or a pain in the ass. He never lied to me. He never changed the deal at the 11th hour. He was always respectful. Puff's been a generous, forgiving, and kindly investor, one who has never stopped giving. So thank you, Puff. Thank you, Jackie Paper. And thank you, Hana Lee. I'm heading your way. To a land called Hana Lee. Puff, I didn't know that. the magic dragon, lives by the sea. Oh, God, I remember watching that as a kid. It was great. I didn't realize till I mean, I was young. When I saw that, I even, you know, living in the Bronx in the basement watching that, my grandparents, young, young, and uh, didn't realize it was about cannabis probably until high school when I read an article about it then. So, kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to read about Burner uh, being on the uh, cover of Forbes, but I'll get that on the next one because uh, it's a very sad day today. It is. My birthday is always going to remind me of my first love. Mrs. Wee Man, you're you're my soulmate. Love I you know. to the day I I'm die. Not, I'm not jealous. This is okay. <laughs> you have your George Clooney moment. Uh-huh. I have my moment, and I've talked about her on the show. And she was using cannabis, and it probably helped her live a little bit longer. Olivia Newton John. Oh, I know it's so sad. I was. We were listening. We to grew li- up with Greece. <sighs> I mean, that was like the movie. Oh, yeah. Man, I I want to. You pl- did always. You've always talked about her. Oh, like she was my first eye. crush, and I was on. I was on. I was on social media today, watching every all all people who I know, all these guys posting. She's my first crush. She was my first crush. She was. She was literally a lot of men. Oh, yeah. Because she was the the golden girl, the goody two shoe girl, but very beautiful, mm-hmm. like the blonde, charming, the, the, and just sweet. when she came on that 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 you know the first scene of Greece, I was like. And then you didn't know she was going to sing. And then she sings, and you're just like seven, eight years old. I think I was seven, eight years old maybe when Grease came out. You just melted, mm-hmm. like hopelessly devoted to you. I mean, it's like every guy's dream. And she's writing the paper in the water, and she sees his face. Like, I know the fucking Grease, but I, you watched it as a young man, as a, I mean, a young boy, and you're just like in love. That was my first crush. Yeah. My first crush. I'll never forget her. You and many, many, many other boys. Uh, like I said on face on mm-hmm. Facebook to, uh, today and, and social media, every one of my guy friends. My first crush. My first crush. My oh my god! I can't believe she's dead. Guy, no girls. There was not. Well, maybe my maybe my mom might have posted something about it, mm-hmm. but I did not see one woman post about Olivia Newton John. It was all guys. It Aww. was all men. Post my first crush, the love of my life. I can't believe she's gone. <laughs> Let's get physical. I mean, like throwing lines from not only just Grease movie songs, but right. from Xanadu. And and we played a bunch of songs from her today. And you were singing. I, even our daughter O Dog was singing right. a couple songs too. It was it was my first crush is gone. That's so sad. I never had an like. I never had another like movie crush or or woman crush. After that, that was the only one I can truly remember. And I think like there's beautiful women in movies, and you, yes, but this was like heartfelt crush. This was like <laughs> okay, Mister. But I'm just trying to say this is my first on yes. my birthday, August eighth is my birthday. She passed, and that's going to be a memory for me now. Like every year on your birthday, yeah. You know, think about, and I never thought about it until we were talking about it today. Like I've always known that you've had a, a little crush on her, but I never correlated. Her name is also the name of our daughter. Our daughter. Is that why you ch- you were when like you, the name? When you said Olivia Newton-John, I, was like, I mean, like, when you said Olivia, <laughs> sorry. Gonna, we're going to name our daughter Olivia Newton-John Romano. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you said that, when you said that, 
I was like, I'm not arguing with you at all. There wasn't even a moment in my mind. But I never, until this moment, (laughs) all these years later, I never thought about that. Yeah. So, I mean. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. It's a sad day. A good day, but also a sad day. And uh, I'll always remember she was my first crush and my only, like, crush at that age. I cannot remember one. I don't know. So here's to you, Olivia Newton-John. I wish I could play your song, but probably get frozen on my account uh i played a song with colors last week and youtube like notified me it's like one Jeez. more time and you gotta get booted blah, 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 blah. kind of bullshit so censorship Olivia, yes olivia newton john may you rest in peace may you rest in good music <laughs> you'll be my first crush mrs we man you got anything else to say no nothing Nothing. All right. Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. You. Happy Thank birthday you. to you. you. Thank Happy you. birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. Now you all know my real name, too. I think everybody already knows it. <laughs> if you go on 8decades.com you know and you it. read our bio, you know it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mr. Weedman. Thank you, Mrs. Weedman. Love of my life. Appreciate you. 50 years, half a century on this earth. I love you all out there in the world. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate you sticking with me. 50 years, some of people have been with me more than others, but enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey, everybody out there. Smoke big fat doinks. As Polly always says, smoke smart. Puffing away. Puff, puff, puff.